Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Digital Rebar and RackN. Welcome to version 11 of the Digital Rebar Online Meetup. Today, we've got Rob and Greg and Victor from the RackN side of the house, and we've got some new folks from the community as well. Look forward to uh, interacting with them. Uh, today on the agenda, we've got DHCP changes, feature flags and version, scrub them bugs, and some next boot magic. Got a lot of talking that Victor is going to do for us today around the DHCP changes. Uh, there's a whole lot of refactoring around on uh, how we do DHCP. Yes? Yes. <laughs> and then, okay, yeah, somebody said something, so I was letting you in. Uh, we've had some changes around Nextboot and how the Nextboot logic and some magic dark secret incantations occur with some auto magic business around subnets. So you can uh, pretty quickly be up and booting with very minimal configuration. Uh, Rob Hirschfeld will be talking a little bit about feature flags and versions. We're also going to talk a little bit more about the UX endpoint versioning stuff, which we talked about uh, last time as well. And then we're going to go through some scrub bug business. And I think we'll probably kick Greg into that since he's been going through the backlog. Uh, and he doesn't know he's in the hot seat for that right now until just now. Uh, but there you go, Greg, you're in the hot seat. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about a whole bunch of fun stuff. We had a, a quite lively and interactive meetup. Uh, we talked about the version to UX endpoints, which we're going to talk a little bit about again this week. Uh, UX content versions is a plugin system and a lot of changes there. So if you wanted to catch up on the old uh, stuff there, check with the old meetup. Uh, as always, we keep uh, a lot of the links and information at the bottom of the agenda to the old information, which I have failed to add the V0010 stuff to. Uh, I will add those here shortly. So that's documented as well. Uh, starting out today, let's talk about, let's get to the right agenda, and let's talk about Victor, DHCP changes. A whole lot of interesting things were happening with uh, the DHC subsystem, DHCP subsystem, and I know you were doing a lot of refactoring there as well as a lot of UEFI uh, boot stuff. Can you talk to us about some of the changes that have gone on there? What was the impetus behind it? Um, what's some of the betterness we're going to see? Okay, so the first thing that um, I guess the most, the, the, the first and probably the most user, user visible thing is now you no longer have to define uh, next server or boot file or any other associated uh, pixie booting options in subnets if you want to just let uh, digital, rebar, digital rebar provision uh, handle everything with uh, what we consider to be sane uh, default bootloaders for the uh, system types that we support. So if you have those in your subnets and uh, you don't want them, you can just, uh, and you, while you're not doing anything custom, you can just uh, rip them out and DRP will uh, fall back to doing the right thing uh, whenever it needs to pixie boot something based off of uh, what system type it's pixie boot. So, um, <coughs> second, oh, sorry. Yeah, Victor, doesn't that include, mean that the DRP needs to know something about the machines to make recommendations like that? Um, very little as it turns out. For just straight up pixie booting, even if we don't know a machine, uh, we pull enough information from the DHCP packets themselves to figure out uh, what mode they're running in, uh, whether or not they're running in legacy BIOS mode or in UFI mode and even what uh, architecture they're running. And we can figure out um, based off of that and whether or not they have the uh, IPIXI option set, um, which is the most appropriate uh, boot file to serve for them if we want them to pixie boot. Uh, okay. So, so, so part of this is about IPIXI and being able to support like UEFI and things like that. Yeah. Um, the other part of it is I've uh, taught the D I've uh, done a bit of integration work with the DHCP system with uh, the actual provisioner side of machines. So whenever DHCP is handing is uh, going through its processing for any given packet, we can decide based off of uh, whether or not we can correlate or we can tie that that DHCP request back to a machine control. Um, whether or not to actually offer pixie files. 
Um, the most common use case for this is for uh, certain Pixie environments, uh, UAFI and uh, iPixie and uh, the old eLilo stuff is uh, particularly susceptible. Uh, they don't have a good way to just uh, tell UEFI or tell uh, the UEFI subsystem to abort all their attempts at networking and just boot straight off of the local disks. Um, so we have a uh, little bit of knowledge baked into the DHCP server that lets us figure out whether or not uh, we're booting a machine that we control and whether or not we want it to actually boot off of the network. And if we don't, we just don't serve it Pixie options and it falls through and falls back to booting off of the local, di booting off of the local disks. Um, and I've got it arranged so that that'll work equally well if we whether or not we are the master DHCP server or even if we're just running in proxy DHCP mode. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's the other thing. I've, uh, I've broke proxy DHCP for a while there for um, UEFI systems and that should now be fully resurrected and we should be able to act as just a straight up proxy DHCP server for UEFI and legacy BIOS. Um, the third thing, or the other thing that is uh, not as user visible, but is very helpful for developers, is uh, we actually have uh, meaningful DCP unit tests now. Um, the unit tests we have can run through full, uh, you know, DCP, you know, handshakes and verify that uh, for any given handshake for a given set of system or for a given set of uh, requests and response that we're always uh, setting the options we expect to set and that the packets that we output are uh, the ones that we expect it to output given a, given a specific uh, input packet. And as far as I can tell, um, I haven't been able to find uh, the only other product that I know that does unit testing like that is uh, Kia. And uh, I hope you like reading impen impenetrable uh, watches of C++ to figure out their unit test framework. So wow, that's a big deal because that means that as we make changes to DHCP server, our, the likelihood of finding some weird corner case that breaks us is like went way, way down. Yeah, it makes it much easier to, uh, if we run into, like I've already run into a couple of the UAFI firmware bugs that have necessitated a little bit of a refactoring with DHCP, or re refactoring how we handle Pixie requests from uh, certain UAFI BIOS revisions. And, mm -hmm. uh, and make sure that uh, we don't, that uh, our handling, um, that we can add a special case and not break other things whenever we encounter for bugs like that in the future. And if we add support for other network booting uh, protocols like uh, ONI or, and uh, whatever Apple uses for their remote booting, um, it's much easier to plug those into DHCP so we can handle remote booting protocols other than Pixie whenever the need arises. Right, that's, no, that's a major code and uh, hygiene component for this um, right it's I, I guess when I watch watching you work through these things and all the new bios variations that come up with Eufy and I know Oni's just as onerous um, sorry yeah. um, sorry one other thing that I uh, yeah. just reminded me of um, if you uh, print the logging for DHCP up to uh, debug or higher we now include uh, full packet traces um, in a format that we can uh, wow. that we can grab and uh, process later. The tracing format is enough to recreate uh, full DHCP handshakes and, uh, you know, run sanity checks against. So would that eliminate needing Wireshark or something like that if you're trying to troubleshoot? Um, not entirely. It only handles the DHCP side of thing, not the TFTP side of things. But for troubleshooting just uh, issues where we're not, for, where the DHCP subsystem isn't sending the options we expect, or that uh, any particular firmware expects we can uh, we can grab those traces and use them as the basis for further unit tests. Wow, that's a big deal. For people who don't remember the um, rewrite last version of the logging system allowed us to have per call or per system logging levels, and so you can get pretty pretty darn detailed without overwhelming the whole system. Yeah, um, I also did a little bit of. Uh, kind of an ad hoc performance testing on my laptop. And uh, in the cheesy testing environment that I was using, the DAC server can handle uh, over a thousand full uh, discover, offer, uh, request, and acknowledge cycles a second. So it uh, usually standard usually standardized at about uh, 1,500 cycles a second. So 
um, pretty, that makes me pretty confident that the DCP server can handle uh, any loads that I can see for the reasonable future. And uh, there's plenty of room for optimization how we handle things, so. That would be a bootstorm, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we could reasonably expect to be able to, you know, handle DCP handshakes for 1500 systems booting at the same time and not explode. Explode in other ways, like transferring files and stuff, but. That's different. Okay, so yeah, that uh, pretty much sums up the DCP work. And uh, since then, I've moved on to doing some. Uh, Nifty stuff with RAID that we'll probably be able to talk about the next. Uh, yeah. Oh, I already fixed it. Yep. All right. Well, that's pretty much it for me on the new DCP enhancements of or DRP. All right, Victor, thank, thank you very much. Got something. Uh, moving on, uh, next up, Rob. You want to talk yeah, to us you. about feature flags and version? And just before you kick into that, I just wanted to remind everyone from two weeks ago, we had a significant change to the UX uh, endpoints. From going forward, everybody should be using portal.rackend.io as their stable UX. If you're playing with new features, then you can play with the other endpoints. I think Rob will reiterate on those a little bit more. Uh, we will also have in the version 3.70 uh, release cycle, we'll have the default redirect go to portal.rackend.io. It will no longer go to rackend.github.io. So with that being said, Rob, take it away. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, some of the feature flag pieces I'm going to talk about are, hey, you can type. Um, some of the feature flag stuff is, is more Greg and Victor to talk about, but I'll, I'll sort of tee it up. Um, to reiterate what, what Shane is saying, uh, we, we are moving away from the GitHub site, the um, GitHub page of site that had been hosting the UX um, it'll still keep hosting it, but it will be um, wildest of Wild West um, experiences, because uh, which it sort of has been so far. But uh, any anything on master will end up at that GitHub site, um, which we don't which we don't make any guarantees will will work in a sustainable way. It's designed for us to find out where there's issues and and, and problems. Uh, from there, things will flow into uh, something called Latest or tip, uh, we've been using, we use both terms interchangeably, um, but latest, um, which is not as wild as, as master, but we'll have, it will be a little bit less stable. So newer, new features in the UX will show up there. So if you're interested to see what, what's, what's coming, um, probably need to start posting lists of, of features that are coming down. And then uh, the normal one is portal. So this portal or uh, uh, or stable, both the same URL, right, will be the the primary UX, um, and then we will version that also. So you will not only have portal, but you'll have it versioned. So if something isn't working in portal, um, we don't we haven't started this process yet, but but after we start doing multiple ver releases on the portal, you will be able to go back to a, a working version for you. Um, so we're, we're trying to create a lot more stability for people who are using uh, the UX in a production way. Um, and then for people who want to take advantage of new features or things that we're adding, because we're pretty active in adding things, um, those will be in the, in the latest. So that's, that's a reiteration. We talked about that last week, but it's always, always bears, bears explaining. All right. Uh, anything else on that front? What about feature feature flags? So yeah, I wanted to. Is there any? Do you have a, a DRP a UX endpoint on your screen by chance? I mm -hmm. do. Uh, where is it? Um, oh, I just 
Yeah, give me just a second. It depends on whether Greg blew away my end. My <laughs> it's all right if if you don't. Um, there it is. All right. So um, if you scroll, if you scroll down where it, so just highlight on the screen. See, it, it bottom bottom right corner, there's system diagnostics. Um, this is portal. This has the old. Oh wow, the old version of version inspections not there. Portal, you want me to go to? No, no, this is. If you do the same site, but as um, tip, you'll get uh, the ver there's a version inspection bug. It looks like you're hitting. Yep. Yeah. And then yay! Oh look, it has the latest code that tells you to switch to stable, so you don't make the mistake of using uh, the the unstable portal. Uh, so uh, some things I wanted to point out on this, if you're not aware of it. So at the bottom right corner of system diagnostics, it tells you um, what version you're using. I'll, I'll put the version um, back up in the, in the title bar too. Um, the version nomenclature that we use, so this is confusing. Uh, version 360-TIP is actually the TIP, it's 125 commits past the TIP of 36, right? We, 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 this is, will be one day 3.7, but it's really 3.6 plus a whole bunch of commits. That's what that version means. So we're, I'm trying to get more consistent in how the UX surfaces that and those, those version number identifiers. So that's, that's important. Um, but the other thing to show here is the feature flags. So every time for the last four versions, I think from like 3.3, three, um, Every time we add a major feature, we also add a feature flag to the code base. And so different capabilities within the system um, contain a feature flag that you can, you can look at the system and see. Um, and then that allows you to code against a feature flag. So you should never be coding um, or building templates against DRP version numbers. Um, the goal here is to build it against a feature flag. Um, so, for example, if you're looking at plugin version two, then um, you would use plugin the feature flag plugin version two to do it. And so, it's especially if you're on edge development, um, this will help you see whether the feature you're thinking about is in much more than trying to interpret the version number. So, when RackN looks at things or at the UX, we always use the flags. Rob, let me interrupt real quick. Uh, yeah. Will, could you please mute your microphone? Oh, sorry, man. I didn't know I was. Thank you, sir. Okay. Carry on. I'll figure it up. Oh, we can meet you from this side, too. I don't have controls. Otherwise, I would have. Oh, I do. I can do, I can do it if I need to. Uh, you got it. Okay, good. Thank you, Will. Um, oops. Um, okay. So... That's and the so the UX and the scripts templates internally key off these flags, and so they they end up being pretty important in how things work. If you're if you're watching Digital Rebar, um, this is all, the the feature flag is actually more important in a lot of cases than the um, uh, than the version from a, from a from management a perspective. Cool. So that was, I was going to say, Greg or Victor, do you want to add anything to that? This is more of your brainchild than, than mine. I'm just implementing it on the UX. For the systemic level or system level, feature flag is correct. There's another part of the system that uses a parallel set of feature flags, which is the tasks and the runner, the DRP CLI, when it's processing jobs, can use feature flags to control the functions and migrating things between the tasks and the runner. This is particularly useful. We use that for the same exit codes um, when we change the exit codes and tasks and how they're supported. And so the system has a global one, but the tasks can override it to indicate to the runner that we're really old or we're really old. you think, you know, uh, our next awesome exit code scheme, which we haven't thought of yet. Hmm. Right. Victor, you're super quiet. Well, we, he was further back, so he's closer now. 
the main thing is that realize that there's another layer of um, feature flags that are used in the runner to task relationship and stage and task relationship. And so those, all of the data is stored as in metadata fields. Um, the system one comes back from the info call and the rest of the objects can have a feature flags metadata that can be used to indicate how it should behave to the care about version, version or feature changes. Makes sense. And then in, in the three seven release, you're changing the code to assume same exit codes. So if the exit codes aren't specified, then we'll, if the flag doesn't specify original exit code, um, or we've never seen it before, we'll assume that it's in. Right. So, so anybody who had, who's been doing template building in the, for, for a long time might, might be impacted by a same exit, needing same exit codes or needing to clean that up. Uh, only if they were to re, uh, create new tasks. So like if they, so this is an issue if you built your own content pack and didn't specify which one you created an object, a task or something, and it's stored in the writable store, then it's stored with a feature flag that makes sense for it. So it's stored with either original exit codes or same exit codes. So that's fine. The challenge is that if you have a content pack and didn't specify it, we will now assume same exit codes. So if you're building your own content packs as a way to deliver your content, then um, you might have an issue. You might. If you only used exit code zero and four, then you're fine. Those map cleanly, which people did. And in fact, you probably weren't aware of it, but your scripts were potentially doing bad things if you didn't realize that. So just because the original exit codes didn't match typical shell usage, so you ended up busted. Yeah, I think I think that was the original exit code. Couldn't think of it for this part. That was the why it was bad, yeah. and we changed it to same exit codes because it matched what most people do for self Yeah. So uh, as more and more people are now actually comfortable enough with the system in writing their own tasks, um, we figured we could change the default to what people normally. Turns out that those aren't sane enough. We'll, you know, <laughs> you need to come up with saner exit codes. Saner exit codes. <laughs> I can just see the new flag, sane and saner. Um, and then, since Shane keeps hovering over the mouse over it, I'll just. So one of the things that the system does is when you log in, um, it will compare your versions of content and plugins against the, the the release versions, and it'll that's what that version inspection list does. It gives you some updates about where, where the system is. Um, so if there's urgent updates or things like that, you'll, you'll find out about it. Fun stuff. Yep. All right. Back to you. All right. Uh, uh, moving on. Bug scrub. Uh, next boot magic, magic, I guess, sort of fell into uh, yeah. Victor's DHCP changes. So, yeah, the next server is part of the flags that are the options that don't have to be specified. The DHCP server will now use the interface and some of the other lookup functions to uh, make sure that's correct based upon the subnet and other stuff that came in matching the best IP. You can still overwrite it, but it's not required. What's the feature flag for that? Uh, strangely enough, there's not one. Oh, whoops. Well, because, okay, so that's an interesting thing. Feature flags are only added when they are impacting some kind of flow. So since if you already had specified next server and boot file, it didn't matter. You just don't okay. have to specify them anymore. 
So it made no difference from that side. There's probably a UX commentary coming up shortly where it could have been used to indicate whether or not we should force those values there. But seeing as, um, yeah. well, seeing as we're about to sh shift all that anyway with stable, um, it seems less than required since you were having to do it anyway. But anyway, uh, and that's why there's not, oh, well, there's two reasons why there's not a feature flag. It's probably not necessarily required and we forgot. Right. <laughs> More though, yeah. Should should the should people remove the next boot setting when they migrate to three seven? The next uh, it's next server. And, next server, sorry, next server. And um, you can, uh, you don't have to. Um, you, it's only needed now if you intend to uh, hand control off to a different DCP or TFTP server. Um, Got it here for uh, TFTP uh, for the uh, boot file. Um, you only need that now if you don't want to use the uh, default uh, uh, LPC Linux.0 for BIOS uh, and uh, IPix that EFI for EFI booting. You only need it if you want to uh, have a custom bootloader all your very own. Yeah, I think I, ca I, think I captured it. Gene, I mean, Bug Scrub's going to take, probably take all the time we've got, did you want to open up community questions first or, or, or time box bug scrub? Uh, yeah, so chucking it out to community, do you have any questions, comments, things you'd like to see, questions you'd like to ask the team before we move into the very exciting and very important bug scrub? Will, you sure you don't have anything you want to ask us? Oh, I, I had muted him when he was wrestling. Okay. You're, you're funny. You're a funny man, Rob. I, no. I also, I also, I also I, can I, mute the camera, by the way. I didn't, I just learned that. It was DRP inception there. I was actually in the machine room using DRP while listening to the DRP. <laughs> awesome. There you go. But no, we'll, we'll continue to chatter. It's just this, this, Department thing is making my hair go grayer than it already is. All right. So, Greg, you want to um, screen share or you want me to drive uh, issues for a bug scrub? Um, well, I can share, I suppose. Though. I suppose. Well, assuming you'll let me. I'm trying to <laughs> disable. I might need to. Stop share. There we go. Stop sharing. Yeah. Oh, look, I can share now. All right. Please do not overshare. Huh. Too late. That's so cool. All right. Hey. So, go ahead. Um, here are the issues in provision. We'll start. There, uh, some of those we can transfer over to the next time. Yeah, well, since it's not exposed, we can put them here for community side. So, um, a lot of the enhancements are just that enhancements. Um, I guess we can talk about them. Um, I'm not sure when we'll get to them. They're not bad ideas. Well, some of them, but. Like this one is uh, give us a side by side or some kind of differential view for importing content. We right now just show you what's in there, but we don't actually show you the differences. Um, it's a great idea. Um, I think we should do it, but that's kind of not sure when it's going to show up. Um, let's see. Why did this come back? Uh, I did not reopen it. Uh, maybe I just didn't close it. No, it just it popped up when I clicked. Uh, we'll ask for an enhancement. I'm going to mark it as such. Um, this is a backend enhancement to basically show um, 
log events for as the system actually requests and gets um, the boot files it needs to actually pixie boot. That way you can kind of get some feedback as the systems are in the no man land of DHCP gave it stuff and it's actually checked in through the DRP CLI in a running booted environment. Um, we actually have better places to do that now. So it's not unreasonable. So, I mean, but I'm, I'm not sure from a priority perspective how high it is, right? So I think that, I mean, it's, is this what you were wanting, Shane? Yep. Well, I mean, I was asking Shane for is this kind of the review you want and Will, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, probably wind up being a two part thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the DHCP side is easy now. The Pixie side is harder because uh, we don't actually keep track of who's pulling what via TFTP or HTTP. Yeah, your code is, uh, is serving the uh, bits there, right? Yeah. yeah, it is. It's just they're not necessarily directly associated. Um, okay. We can tell on some of the things that get rendered, but on some of the things that aren't being rendered, it's a little tougher. All right. So I didn't know what the technical challenge was. It's more like when you pick something, it would be nice to know, oh, I see it has started. And, yeah. you know, now we wait. Because sometimes when I'm remote, I don't have a console. So you're wondering what's going on. Right, right now, it'd be hard to filter out what events we send out. Uh, so you potentially, uh, you get the events for uh, Pixie Linux zero and all the other stuff. And then whenever you want to, to install the OS, you get an event for every single file we serve via the static file server there. And right. Yeah. There's a flooding yeah. we have to deal with. Okay, so um, we actually had somebody in the community want to try and do um, Windows DRP, running DRP on Windows. And um, so we looked into that. Um, we updated some of the things so that it would look nicer on Windows and you could actually extract the tree. But um, um, I know that there are chunks of uh, functionality that DR provision relies on in the back end that just Go has not implemented them on Windows. And so the real reason we build Windows, and that's why it's in the system, is because DRP CLI actually can run, minus the go high part, um, on a Windows system to do things like updating parameters and state and stuff. So that is what why we really build a Windows component. Um, I'm going to leave this here um, for now, but realize this is probably not coming for quite some time. Um, we do make sure it runs on Mac and Linux, though. Um, let's see. Bulk actions, so fail selections, fail. Yeah, okay, so there's um, there's two bugs, or I opened a bug on this on our internal UX tracking one, too. I don't think it's actually an enhancement. I think it's actually, but um, I'm going to mark it as, oh. Oh, we have a provision UX bug. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, I, I, Sorry. I just click around too much. So we'll be looking into this. Um, I have a replication case for it for our testing in the other bug in the UX site. So um, let's see. Return. So th this is a little bit of a cosmetic when you uh, pop out to the content catalog, it's not very easy to return to the endpoint you were on. You can select the hamburger menu drop down last uh, endpoint, but that drops you back into the starting page for an endpoint as opposed to the last panel or page you were on on the endpoint. So chucking an idea out there, presumably we should be able to capture from the reefer um, where you came from and just try to link back to that page. So when you're done with a content catalog, you can return to the page you're on in the endpoint. I mean, it seems reasonable. I'm not sure how easy it will be, but it seems um, easy. is not my problem. Easy is uh, your guys' problem. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not hard. It's, I, just, for, I just missed it. This one's hard. Yeah, this one's not. Mm -hmm. But I did, I did make the list smaller. 
Yeah, so smaller will work, I think, for a while, but as soon as we start growing endpoint or stage maps uh, beyond what smaller can render, then we're going to run into the same issue again. So ultimately, yeah, I, long term, we, we want to find a fix for rendering this differently. Uh, if we want to go smaller for now, just to make it easier when we hit like four or five stages and then shrink them, that, that would be okay for now. Yeah. I did. I made it. I made it smaller already. Um, in yeah. the, it's, it's in test. I. It's, I have it, some workflows that are like seven or eight or nine deep now, and so it's kind of funky. Yeah, I could take. I could take the text out of them, um, or truncate the text, which would make them shorter. If when you they're can long. truncate and make the text scrollable, so you can have you know eight characters guaranteed for text or something, and then. It's scroll fields in there. I don't know how much yeah, it's, free you yeah. get with what with the React we're using. This is this is yeah. The problem is it's a, it's actually a, a widget. It doesn't have a lot of controls on it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, anyway, it's I think it's reasonable. It's one we'll be needing to get to as people use more workflows. Uh, which I'm biting my tongue on a different topic. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's Greg and I will start. With. Yeah. Well, not just. Yeah. Um, I looked into this one, Shane. Um, there is a new, oh, so there's a usage thing that we need to work through that we need to fix Greg's UI usage methodology. But turns out if you just click the X, X button, that will apply the filters that you changed. So that's how it works. <laughs> so okay. there is no save. There's so dismiss my window. And exit the window and then they'll be reapplied. Um, so it, it's, like I said, it's working as designed, but designed poorly. So uh, we probably should at least review that at some point. Um, okay. There's a future feature that we talked about is saved filters and stuff like that, but. Maybe like save and cancel would be the two standard uh, action buttons you should have there. Whatever. Yeah, so there's some rework there and that makes sense. Um, add job logs to machines. So I was looking at this. It looks like there's a nice. There is yeah, that's a fixed. I did. I, that's what the verify flag means. Wait, I verified it wrong. Oh. So it was two pieces. One was, can I have a quick link to get to jobs? And that's there. But it doesn't seem to apply the UUID filter appropriately. Yeah, I, I haven't been able to get one to apply for me. Right, and so there's a bigger issue that when you hit click that button, there's no actual setting of the filters appropriately. And then there's the question of do the filters work too? I was looking at both. So oh, I missed I missed that you wanted the filters. Um, so the links are nice; they quickly get you there. But based upon the selected items, the goal was to have a filtered set of machines, and so that's why I undid it. Oh. Uh, uh, so anyway, that's the that's, aspect of it. Sorry, okay. I, I thought that was that's two requests to me. But okay. But the remaining one I think is the actual one he was really wanting. Got so it. That's why I un unverified it. The the link is there, which is what she wanted. So that's fine. And I can do that generically off of other uh, tables. It just I feel weird having two navigation paths, but I sometimes. I tend to agree though. Because it picked up the filter information from the bulk action table, I, it seemed like a reasonable button to have. So if the bulk action or machines panels just reference the filters or the jobs page with the appropriate filter applied, that would do the same thing. And it would jump you to the jobs with a specific filter for a given machine or yeah, that's, parameter. That's, that's what you were intending for that link. The challenge yeah. is... <laughs> Be dynamically built and stuff like that, right? There, yeah, we'd have to save the session state across requests, which is reasonable. It's just isn't the way it works right now. Yeah. Right, got it, got it. Oh, I haven't done the delete jobs button. Yeah. Yeah, there's a delete all request. There's a side effect of can we even make that asynchronous? But um, that would have to be a UI side thing. Right now, there's not a concept of all of something in the API. Yeah, I, I ran in to that with trying to clean up an endpoint going through provision, deprovision, deprovision. I want to wipe things clean, start over. Um, wiping a five or 600 job logs took forever. 
Yeah. You bet. So it makes sense. Um, there's probably a UI side adjustment and then there's an API features kind of thing to think about. Yeah, but UI is going to make a lot of cost. <laughs> yeah, what you, <laughs> right now is what you'll have to do. And I think that's okay to start. Well, you might want to think about a filter to delete, which is a funky request. Uh, yeah. So anyway, um, community produces uh, erroneous warnings. I couldn't recreate this, strangely enough, I was trying, which leads me to a request is um, now that we have in the UX um, much better um, version information, it would be very helpful if when people open bugs to throw the um, content version and the um, DRP version in so that it's easier to try and recreate some of these. Um, okay. I agree that this could have happened. I believe that the, with some of the changes we made and how the back end passes errors up, that is less likely to happen. So I don't know if Will, if you're listening, if you remember when you, because I reproduced this after Will had produced it and then filed the bug for it. Okay. Um, yeah, it, steps would be awesome, but yep. uh, if possible. Sometimes you just don't get that. But um, so I tried. Um, it might be useful to have more info on this one, um, or to retry it here with uh, Tip and. 3.7 here when it comes out in a day or two. Right. Um, let's see, theme switcher. Okay. Skip it for now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got, I, I, got, I got multiple themes working in the uh, dev UI. Yeah, okay. That's nice. Oh, another programmer. That's cool. Uh, let's see. And then we've been through a lot of these other ones before. I cleaned up some um, things like um, wanting more unit tests for the uh, UX, being able to pass more information around as metadata so that we can make some more automated testing. I mean, it's a good idea. Um, there's this one, which was um, both Moosey and, um, was it? yeah. And uh, Shane recreated um, it, uh, I'm not sure why it happened. I know you guys did it, and then I changed some things, and I don't know if you can still do it. Because I never root caused what was actually happening underneath. Um, right. I will uh, revisit that with. Uh, Current tip so and see if it's still there. Go ahead, Mitchie. So I um I I did stumble onto something uh, earlier, technically yes yesterday for me, but like a couple hours ago. Uh, so if I so so okay so basically I wait until um the provisioning is done and like it's waiting on uh. It's waiting for the runner to stop. But if I, sorry, it's it's like four a.m. here. Um, oh, goodness. Uh, Take your time. Hold on. Thank you for joining us at four a.m. <laughs> You're <fellow. laughs> Okay, so like, if I update. Um, Runnable to true, um, it'll actually change the stage back to local, which is what I'm expecting it. Or expecting it, or to, uh, <laughs> it, it'll let complete no wait, like exit the runner, and then let the machine reboot. Um, yeah. Okay. It, it does, and I think that's working as designed. What we probably want to do is start a chat session when you're uh, potentially more awake <laughs> or able to anyway. <laughs> uh, 
because I, I think there's probably some stage stuff that we want to walk through and how stages and tasks and the um, keep running flags interact because I suspect that's what you're hitting. Would be my guess. So wait, uh, I, I think the issue that I just talked about is different from this issue, but I am also running into this issue as well. Uh, oh. With, uh, 3.6. Like, if I downgrade to 3.2, I don't uh, run into this error. Like, I, I can change the stage and I'll change the stage correctly. But uh, if I'm running 3.4 uh, or 3.6 um, and then try to uh, run machine stage UID and then the stage I want to change it to, it'll give me this patch error. Have you been able to try? Uh the current tip, so 360 tip. Um, uh, no, I haven't. Okay. Okay. Three six zero, oh, yeah, but not three two one. Right. Yeah. So three two one works successfully. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. Well. <laughs> We're going back in the dark ages with three, two, one. There's a, quite a few. Uh, hey, man, backwards compatibility. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no API left behind. All right. Uh, we'll keep going from there. Um, <laughs> this is a UX request for raw. Um, just give me a raw JSON view of the edit object. Um, so that you can and see. I guess along with that is the pretty print request to be done correctly because I don't want to look at raw JSON without some colorization to it. Yeah. But I do, I do want to very often see the, the straight up JSON. I like the rendered views for the components, but there's some times when I really want to look at just the raw JSON. I don't know why. There's something wrong with yeah. that. You, you, can, you can also um, use the, the debug feature in the browser and look at the the actual web requests, but it's not as convenient. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thanks, Rob. I can also use a CLI and JQ, <laughs> which is what yeah, I baby. usually do. But yeah, baby. <laughs> All right. We're talking about a UX feature here, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this one, I actually, so this is basically, can we have a content helper for the CLI? And that will pull contents from the rack and SAS. And in general, I've been against that because I would like to not have SAS content in the DRPC a lot from Mac inside. So my current view of this is to potentially have a, um, a new command potentially that knows how to talk to the SAS in a programmatic way so that you can get content and then use DRPC a lot to update it. Um, just because I've not necessarily wanted to tie some of the racking components to uh, the DRPC Lite component. Right. Um, it's a good idea, but uh, my current thought would be to actually drive it through a new command that would hide and let you do the authentication and get your appropriate stuff based upon the user you logged in and what organization you want to pull from and stuff like that. Right. So. Sure. Um, that's currently where my head is on this one, is that it would be more of a rack and SAS tool than a DRP tool. Um, let's see. Where was I? I don't know. I'm making stuff up here. Um, too small height for input fields. Okay. Oh, all right. Some tweaks for that from one of our. Oh, this is also happening to me as well. Okay. Uh, what browser are you using? Uh, the same. Well, FF58, which is current uh, Firefox. Oh, FF, beta. Firefox. Sorry, yeah. Yep. FF57 dot dot, and I was thinking of a Shaw sum for Sledgehammer. Yeah. I've <laughs> <laughs> been messing with Shaw sums lately today. Makes sense. Yeah, it shouldn't be that hard to do. So, um, and actually. Who uh, so is T O O? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll leave people's grammar to themselves. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, except for yours, I'll have to ask the crap out of you about that. But um, remove endpoints on rack and portal save button doesn't work. That may actually be resolved, but. Oh. It's hard coded. Hide's hard coded. Yeah, quit fixing. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! That was a one character fix, I though. Yeah, I know, but, add, the, um, add the label. <laughs> do you, do you, this week. All right. Oh no. Okay. So they retried it, and it didn't seem to be. Yeah, I found that this is is for some reason it comes and goes. I don't know why. I I need to. All right. So we'll spend some time on it. It's still it's still it's still a problem. I don't know what ca I don't know what causes it. Okay. Didn't I have that? And you took care of it for me, Rob. My first endpoint. I had two of the same. Oh uh, yeah, there there can be some bad bad data in the endpoints. So um, if somebody has it and they give me uh, just just fill out a support ticket on the in the rack and portal, then we can fix it in the back end. Uh, I don't know if you can see enough. There's uh, we changed the data formats, and so it there's some old data in the in early users. It may be resolved. You might want to look at hit. Ivan didn't note that. So okay. Um, let's see. Add delete to right side pop ups. This is a feature request. So basically, oh, we did that. You, yeah. You, can you delete? Didn't we do that? I, yeah. I think that's a pretty old one. Yeah. No, I, th I thought we'd done it during. Uh, well, shoot. No, we had a clone. We didn't add delete. Um, Clone was a long time ago. I think there's I think there's some actual uh, challenges on doing it there because you you have the context that you're in. Um, right. It, yeah. it was not an easy place to add delete, I believe. So it was delayed. Uh, let's see. Delete uh, bulk action has no delete as well. We yeah, and so. Um, Isaac and I went around about this and he kept saying, but it's in machines. And I'm like, yes, it's in machines, but I work in, a lot of people work in the bulk action screen frequently. So delete is one of those ones I think that can operate across bulk actions, but clone is not one that can easily be done. So his point was clone and delete should be in machines. Uh, my point or my contention is delete is a bulk operation. Clone is not a bulk operation. How it fits in the UX is a different question. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I could add it at the top with a, with a list of buttons right. where delete normally shows up. Um, I tend to think, I, I tend to agree with Shane. I found that it's a little um, disconcerting to go to bulk actions to think about deleting because I'm bulk acting everything else there. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, when you had originally made the request, I had thought of it like the other buttons that are on bulk actions. The setting buttons, and but it's not. I think it's not hard to do. Um, internally, machines can't begin with uh, numbers. Even mm. with DNS and, and time allow it. I think that was fixed. Uh, I'm not sure. No, I didn't undo it. It might have been fixed. I'm, right. I'm pretty sure it was fixed, but I think we failed to mark the, that. All right. Um, let's see. There was that. Um, enhance endpoint registration. Another request to make that nicer in the UX. Um, yeah, I think it actually does. Uh, it does remember your list of endpoints. So uh, it does, yeah. Yeah, you might want to check it and make sure. Um, I'll, I'll have to look at the bug. Yeah. So we think it's resolved. So. There's one of those, the lock one was actually fixed. Yeah, I undid it because I tested it and it doesn't. It's still. Oh, uh, crap. All right. So I, yeah, it's, I still see it. I gave a very explicit test case. OK, good. Do that. Uh, choose your endpoint of choice, but um, 
I was doing it locally. Really right yeah. Okay. I know it's. I know. I know what's happening. It might be a simple. Okay. Um. Yeah, that's not happening anytime soon. With hmm. the compression. Uh, plugin updated, model. Updated plugin model. Oh wait. It's a three seven deliverable. Yeah, that's in three seven. There we go. Yeah, I mean, for us, really. But yeah, okay. Um, yeah, we we chose not to do HashiCorp because of reasons, but it's better now, much better. I haven't noticed the plugin dropouts and other stuff we were getting from before. So that's been good. Um, let's see, resizable content windows. Um, yeah. Meh. Yep. <laughs> meh. <laughs> I heard a meh. That was awesome. I. Cool idea. I. I. It actually shouldn't be that hard. I don't know why. Colorized print. Oh, somebody thinks they're there. For some things, I think. Some things. Like yeah, it, that, that was a hit and miss, and it's mostly a miss still. Um, okay, so what I would request is please be specific in pages for this um, so we can talk. Well, I had assumed at any point we render JSON, we should, we, we should pass through this. Simple. Well, as a user, case statement, it's that simple. Um, okay, we can leave that. Down. I will go. I will go through the. I'll go through the UX though and document it better if you'd like. It's more of there. Are, okay. Deleting. Yeah, we need. To, I tested this this morning, and um, there's a specific use case of. Right. What what I did to ver the the thing I did for this was I um, it shows at least in the preferences it gives you a big warning if you're using preferences that don't that don't work. No, that was that was this is a different one. That one did validate correctly and you exceeded expectations, um, and that was awesome. This is if I try and delete an object, sometimes it just doesn't. Right. And the API is giving feedback saying, uh, no, you can't because it's in use. Right. And it was referenced and it never said anything. It just failed silently. So yeah. So we don't bubble up errors. This is a generic thing where sometimes yeah. the errors get swallowed. Yeah. And so you had marked it as verified. So I unmarked it. And yeah. I did, I did something different than that. Yeah. So thing. I, I gave you an ex, uh, a, a test case that's pretty simple and straightforward. Yeah. So, um, let's see. You could you could use uh, um, Claudia as like Clippy in the corner. <laughs> Just say no. Um. Okay, so the rest of these are really old, and I should go through them as we're at the top of the hour, um, and. We, and some of them stay because they're unit tests we need to add to complete more coverage. Um, or some requests like the template preview and boot in preview. That actually might be coming, Will. Um, there's some use cases for them now. Um, that, and we have pieces better in place to drive them. Um, and then filtering enhancements. And then I need to check that. I'm not sure that's true. But oh, that's me. Ouch. 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 Loud, loud, and ouch. Sorry. Well, you know, whatever. Um, here we go. Um, so that's those bugs. The other ones I wanted to get to real quick were in the default content. Um, mm -hmm. And one is the discussion I kind of started today on consolidation. I think we're gonna, I need to think about that one some more. It's a reasonable request. 
And then the same thing with the fixing of the SSH access mode, how it, sometimes you can raise incorrect files. And Will has a good write up in there and just needs to take time to go and, and test it. So that was reasonable and good. So those are the, the that's kind of the set of bugs um, that were out there. Um, I'm not sure, like I said, 3.7 is just around the corner. So I was trying to pull in any of the easy, quick ones into that um, to see. And we, I, we kind of fixed some too that floated up. Um, so expect 3.7 to show up here in the next day or two. Um, there'll be, a, the plugins will jump to 2.0 to reflect the fact that they're all version two plugins now. Um, and Terraform will catch an update as well. We've separated the content out um, and a few other things will show up in that. Um, and then the content pieces will version up as well because we put some bugs and some other things found by various people. So um, just realize that's all about to pop out here shortly. Okay. All right. Anything else, Craig? That's all. All right. Well, that's it. We're at the top of the hour. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating. We will see you in two weeks for version 12, and we'll hopefully see you online on Pound Community. Thank you very much, everyone.